You are listening to Plastic Surgery Uncensored with Dr. Roddy Raban on Revolver Podcast. On this episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored, we're continuing on the top of anesthesia with my dear friend and colleague, Michael Houston, and we're going to really sort of unveil the truth and try to demystify anesthesia and bring light to all the wonderful elements of anesthesia and get rid of as many of the fears as possible. So you want to make sure to tune in and listen carefully because I'm sure you're going to be enlightened. Welcome back to another episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. It's your host, Dr. Roddy Raban. I am uh, honored to have my co-host today, which is Dr. Michael Houston, who is my co-pilot in surgery, my anesthesiologist and right-hand woman. So if you guys listen to our last episode, which I think you'd find very fascinating, the goal of this, these two segments are to, I don't want to say demystify, but bring the truth out about anesthesia. Many, many times I have patients bring up their fear of anesthesia. Anesthesia is to me as, as are sharks. So sharks are always feared, but the reality is the number of shark deaths are very low. Sharks have been made to be dangerous due to the movie Jaws. And the reality is the more you learn about sharks, the more you respect them and realize that they're amazing, gentle animals. The truth is anesthesia is the same. Anesthesia has very few complications and very few deaths as long as you don't poke the shark. And so as long as you understand anesthesia and you will realize how amazing anesthesia can be without it, we wouldn't do any of these surgeries. And the way to learn about it is from an expert. And the expert isn't in somewhere in Tijuana, but here next to me. So we want to talk about sort of the patient experience. You know, people think you just show up and you just have great anesthesia, but there's a lot of preparation that goes into getting patients ready for anesthesia. And so we don't just whimsically decide that you're good to go. We have protocols and we have, we have, we have things that we follow. So uh, first of all, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Of course. So talk to me a little about your patient day of surgery and sort of preparation slash what you do what's your what's your thing how do you go mm -hmm. um first of all the patient uh will arrive but they will arrive having had all of their clearance done what does that mean uh, they will have all of their history and physical completed they will have all of their lab work done any any relevant lab work definitely basic lab work for everyone anyone who has any other medical condition will have extra thyroid studies or extra you know, extra x-ray done or extra CT scan done, or they will have seen their cardiologist or they've seen their now who decides lung that, doctor. right? Um, usually they will go uh, actually here first. So for example, they'll, they'll come here. So it would be their surgeon that sees them first, sees them first. Um, if, if, if you are a conscientious or thorough surgeon, you will have like all of the basic lab done labs done. If the patient has any medical history, you'll have a note from their doctor. And then depending on their regular doctor, then depending on the note from their main doctor, it may say, oh, they just need to see the cardiologist or they need to see the pulmonologist. If there's any question, um, the surgeon can consult with the anesthesiologist. And so oftentimes I'll say, oh, you know what? They, they do need to see the hematologist because this, this lab is a little unusual. Um, but for just the basic patients to have the basic lab work done, sometimes you find something that that no one knew that the patient right. honestly did not know about, and you can you can let them know about that, and then have a plan uh, for that going into surgery. So let me let me get this part of it figured out for people because people always ask me what are the preparations. So one of the things that people do not understand is there's two key components. Number one, you better hope that your doctor and your anesthesiologist communicate regularly. The percentage of physicians that speak to their anesthesiologist on a regular basis is, I, and I'm exaggerating people, is 1%. Why? Because most doctors don't work with the same anesthesiologist and they don't, they don't know who their anesthesiologist that day is. They show up and there's one of many anesthesiologists. So they're not generally communicating on a regular basis. The reason why I love the way we do medicine, and I think it really is a role model. It's not possible in a lot of environments, but I think it's the ideal model is that when you have a small, compact, reproducible, recurring team, all members of that team are always involved. So if I have a patient that I see in the office that wants a breast dog and has a funky something, instead of waiting to the day of surgery for them to see 
my Kel, and she's like, well, what the hell is this? I will have called her in advance, and she will have said to me, mm, no, that's okay, no problem. She's got Raynaud's, I'm okay, I'm going to hydrate her and give her heart water. So that's issue number one. The second thing is that you assume that your doctor will necessarily send you for the right labs. Or what? not necessarily. I happen to be super compulsive. The last thing I want to do is operate on you and see you have a complication outside the realm of plastic surgery. So what does that mean? You have a heart problem and you end up having a heart attack or you have pulmonary issues and you don't breathe or you end up having an ischemic issue. So what does that mean? That means so I, it's in my best interest to make sure that you are really prepped before surgery. Now, many doctors don't gloss over that because the reality is that I may cancel you. Is that good for me? I mean, is that in my best interest to cancel your case? No. So it's best to not ask a lot of information because that's less I need to worry about. But the truth is you and your doctor, that is your surgeon, need to be really upfront and very aggressive about making you cleared. So clearance, clearing your first surgery can be as simple as basic labs. You're a 30-year-old healthy person who's getting your nose done and as complicated as seeing your cardiologist and doing an echo and a stress test because you had a stent placed several years ago. It doesn't mean you can't have surgery. It just means you require more workup. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important you understand this. I always mention it. People assume there's this overriding like group of people that are watching over you. It's not the case. Things get lost in the cracks. You got to be your own advocate. And if you know you have a heart, heart condition, you got to be pushing everybody like, is my heart okay? Da, da, da. You mm -hmm. got to bring it up. Or, or um, we've had over the past year, we had like three people. Diabetes, right? And the diabetes is just like not under control. Not like under their control. Blood sugars not under so control. So perfect example. It's like, it's like I understand you want to have this like seven hour facelift combo, something, something like okay. You have to get your blood sugar perfect together example. first. You're not, a, it's not going to heal. We had that. You're patient, going right? to get an infection. You're going to have a kidney problem. Like. Yeah. I'm so, looking out for you. Yeah. You know? So we had a patient that's a perfect example. Lovely, lovely young lady. She came in for some facial surgery. It wasn't going to be like a seven hour case. Her diabetes was out of control. I said, listen, you got to. So I called, I called her internist. I spoke to her internist. We got her on the meds. I saw her back in three months and she should have been totally dialed in. Mm -hmm. Not even close. <laughs> Why? Because she just didn't adhere to it. So did we do her surgery? No, mm -mm. she waited like eight months. Cause these, these are elective surgeries. So if something is, you know, if it's not something like super tiny, that's like, oh yeah, I can just, I can take care of their blood pressure that day or something. If it's anything beyond that, then it's like, this is an elective surgery. So you have to, that's you have what to we, get it That's together. what we tell people. If you have a gunshot and you're hemorrhaging or you're having a heart attack, you just got to go. You got to right. do the surgery. Oh, you ate an hour ago, but you, but you're having a, a bleeding esophageal varicy. I know none of you knows what the hell that means, but the point is it's an emergency. We got to operate. But if you're like, you know what? On Tuesday, I think I want to have a facelift. There is absolutely no reason for you to have that facelift unless you're perfectly dialed in. So if there's something that's off, then guess what? You're going to have to come another Tuesday because we're not going to do it that day. So <laughs> preparation is super important. Keep going. You were saying that you prep them and they're prepared. What else do you yeah. do so, for your... So once, so once the person is ready, cleared, um, and optimized for surgery, which most people are optimized as soon as they follow the fasting that they're healthy all they need to do is just follow the directions don't take any you know aspirin don't take any advil so Stay. what are those let's be specific so people are listening because mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is um we're doing this podcast not because if you're coming here because if you come here then you'll have us but we're doing this because you're in wyoming or <laughs> in nebraska or i don't know west lake village and you're gonna have it so you got to sort of be in so you don't want to take what? Things that make you bleed. So Anything blood thinners. That, blood, right? blood thinners. Like um, Motrin, Advil, Ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, Naproxen, mm -hmm. aspirin. and Aspirin. I say that five times a day. And so then I a lot of memorize. natural foods and supplements. Right. Of like which fish you oil, give people flax seeds. I give them a list. So you mm -hmm. want to be off all that. What other things that you want to, that are you going to make you prepared? What other, what medications you want them to take in the morning of their the The morning, the morning meds? of... Um, Maybe some of their diabetic meds, those we would go over them in specific. So it, it can vary. Um, it depends if they're taking oral meds, if they're taking injecting insulin. Um, but we would go over that with them in advance. And we've done that specifically, like for people who are in that situation. Blood pressure medications, you can take most of them. There is a certain group that you, I prefer for patients not to take it the day of, and I'll just handle their blood pressure myself and I know a lot of other anesthesia, anesthesiology colleagues of mine 
who feel the same way, and those are um, ACE inhibitors. So what that so means, if someone's if on those, so, they know they're on. Those. So what that means, if you're listening, is you don't decide. You need to have a good conversation with your anesthesiologist and your doctor, and say, "Hey, guys, I'm a diabetic and I have blood pressure issues. These are my meds. Should I take them in the morning of, or not take them? Should I take them with a sip of water? Again, dialogue." So what's this whole idea of not drinking overnight? I mean, people are parched in the morning. <laughs> when somebody asks a great question, hydration is super important, but then you come dehydrated. What the hell is all that about? So in, in truth, so in, in practice, we tell people NPO for eight hours before no, surgery. Nothing by, nothing, nothing per oral, right? Nothing per oral, except meds that have been, you have been told to go ahead and take with a sip of water. Um, so... Now, if you're sur- let's say your surgery is at 11 a.m., technically you could eat something at 3 a.m. Are most people asleep? I mean, awake at 3 a.m.? No. So that we, it tends to be like NPO after midnight. After midnight. Right. right. Now, if Why? you look at the, the, the main reason for staying NPO for a certain amount of time is to prevent your risk of having gastric contents come up into your lungs, you aspirate. All right, you so get you want to have enough pneumonia. time mm-hmm. where your stomach is empty. Empty. Of food and or liquids. Because if your stomach is full and you get anesthesia, you could vomit it up and it could go into your trachea and that's called aspiration where contents get into your lungs. That's bad. Yes? That's bad, yes. yes. Okay, yeah. So now, that's why you're MPO, by the now, way. Now, I will say, I think I won't go into them in super detail, but... Actually, there are truly different guidelines for if someone were to drink a whole cup of clear water. Actually, it's a shorter amount of time. Juice is actually a shorter amount of time. But we'll just assume for the person listening. No, it (laughs) ends up, so what happens is it ends up being confusing. One person may write it down in their journal and be like right on top of it and follow it exactly. And the next person will like drink the cup of water and it's 5 a.m. and they forgot and then they take a bite of their bagel and now they get to the place and it's like, you had a bite of bagel? Oh, you're canceled or oh, you're delayed. So you want to have your stomach empty. So, So that's why a lot of places, unless they have like a really, like a whole team bigger than than what most places have available. Uh, that's why with a few exceptions, people will just say NPO after midnight because that gives the most likelihood that your stomach will be empty and you'll be able to have your surgery as scheduled like in that it. regard. Okay. So those are the things that you do. They're prepped. You come in, you see them. And then um, anything else that you do in your relax... You, you, I have a segment here. I said something you says relaxation. So, yeah. So, so, so many of the patients that I see... Um, even Dr. Raban's patients, and even though he, they've been working with him and his great office staff here, you know, they're still nervous because now it's, it's the day of, you know what I mean? So and imagine you have like a, the altar. like a big test coming up or like a big like event coming up or something. So it's a big event. So they're, they're, many of the patients are nervous the day of. So I just talk to them. Usually I have like a few jokes and like literally they always work on everybody. I'm not going to give them away to other people. So yeah, how steal this. Exactly. But, um, you know, and it just it just gets them like laughing, and I'm like, "Hey, we're gonna be we're gonna be fine. I'm gonna take great care of you. I'm not gonna let anything happen to you. Um, if in the rare chance that something unusual happens, you know, I will ask Dr. Raban to like stop the surgery. I'm not gonna let anything you know dangerous happen to you." So I think what you just said, in my opinion, is the defining difference between an okay and a great anesthesiologist. It's expected that your anesthesiologist is well trained. It's expected that your anesthesiologist knows what they're doing, and it's expected that your anesthesiologist will protect you. Where the difference will be between a good anesthesiologist and a great anesthesiologist is what you just said, which is that you are one of those types of people that's very calming and very sweet to the patients. And over and over and over again, my patients will say, that Dr. Houston, she was so lovely. Because what they remember in that moment, in their moment of fear and anxiety, is the compassion and the humanness of anesthesia which is you come, you hold their hand, you say a few jokes, you break the ice and you ease their anxiety because you can easily come in there and be like, it's going to be great. You're going to be fine. Wheel it to the back, set, pump them with some drugs and boom, they're gone. They're out. So what difference does it make? So where you, I think, excel and I, and I think that you would hope that for your anesthesiologist, wherever you are, is that your anesthesiologist, aside from being outstanding, has to care about you. And so every specialty has that part of it, which is the human, humanistic side of it. And I think that's, I think the same is true when you're like doing interventional radiology and you're standing on the CAT scanner. If the person who's doing the procedure is lovely, it makes you feel better. And so I think that's really, really important. 
Um, we're going to take a quick break, we're at, and then we'll come back and wrap up our session together with Michael. Um, I hope you guys are finding this super um, useful and interesting because I think there's definitely a, a shortage of anesthesia-related information out there, at least good ones. So uh, make sure to follow up and tune in with uh, Plastic Surgery Uncensored. You are listening to Plastic Surgery Uncensored with Dr. Roddy Raban on Revolver Podcast. Welcome back to Plastic Surgery Uncensored. Uh, it's, uh, I'm here with my dear friend and colleague, Michael Houston, who is an extraordinary anesthesiologist. And I'm super excited about this segment as we've been sort of over two episodes diving into sort of, I don't know, the myth, the truth, the mystery of anesthesia. It's an area that is so important to people having surgery, yet so, under, under, so not understood and creates so much fear and anxiety, um, which I don't think is necessary. Again, I always equate it to Sharks, I, I, you know, sharks have this terrible, you know, um, they're, people are afraid of them. But in reality, you know, again, if you, if you don't feed them chum and b- b- blood in the water, you should be okay. So we're going to get to the last segment of which is sort of unexpected. Like, we don't want to sugarcoat everything because that's not the point. The point is to talk about it in reality and cover your ears, but shit happens. And so, you, you, and, and so we want to make sure that when th- something doesn't go right... You have a plan, you address it, and then you move on. While it is incredibly rare, it's not zero. And so having a great anesthesiologist or having a team approach you and I together really makes a big difference. So let's talk about some of the unexpected things that we've had in our case. Um, what, one of them was, a, was an airway thing. So tell me about what airway issues. Uh, recently, there was a patient who had an unexpected, difficult airway. And what does that mean? So um, we brought her into the room. Monitor's on, everything's going great. Um, have her go off to sleep. And um, luckily I did anticipate that her airway would be not the easiest airway, uh, not the easiest person to put the tube in, to intubate. Not the easiest so what that means, easiest airway, just so I can elaborate a little bit because I, 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 I'm a lay person when it comes to anesthesia, is that at the end of the day, what, it, what aside from the medication portion, the actual act of putting the tube into the, between the vocal cords is called intubating. You're actually mm-hmm. putting the tube in. Right. And in some people it's easy because their anatomy is very favorable and you look straight inside their mouth and boom, there it is. Mm-hmm. And you can put the tube in super easy. And some people, their anatomy is super difficult. And that entry, the trachea. And for most people it's easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's very rare for it not to be, but you just don't know because you can't really tell from the outside always. Right. And in some people, the, airway or the opening is far away or weird or hard to find, mm-hmm. in which case it's a difficult airway. So go mm-hmm. ahead. So we put her right. asleep. And, and so, some people, um, and this is this is starting to increase in the population, I think, where some people have a lot of extra tissue, like between where their mouth starts and where the vocal cords so are. The so the space is kind of tissue. Is, tissue. Is thick and smaller visibility. Yes. So we put this lady to sleep and you go in there to look and... Go in there to look, and but we'll... using different different um, mechanisms and different tools. Long story short, couldn't see it. So, luckily, luckily, one thing I always do, um, as you know, is even on people with easy airways, I always have a certain way that I give people the medications so that if I need to, I can get them just breathing on their own right. really fast. It's so, called prepared. You're prepared. <laughs> so I, I let her start breathing on her own, and then we said... We need to tell her what's going on. So right. um, so we had a long case that day. So yeah. this is an example. This patient had a long case scheduled, and the case had two parts to it, a front and back. In other words, we were going to start her on her stomach, facing down, do the stuff, and then turn around and do the stuff in the front. For anesthesiologists, when the patient is facing down, it's much more challenging because they don't have access to the airway. And if God forbid that tube comes out, you can't get to it. And secondly, you are breathing sort of non-conventionally. You're actually breathing on your lungs. So it's heavy and it's not easy to ventilate. So it's not ideal. So we actually woke the patient up. Yep. And we said to her. Uh, Woke her up and said, I'm going to try this. Here's what's happened. Here's what's going on with your body. We we got a special um, piece of equipment, a glidoscope, and we're going to try to get you intubated. And if we can, we'll proceed with the first part of your surgery today. Okay. So that right there, guys, I want you to listen. 
is good medicine. Good medicine is never, never compromising the well-being of a patient for any reason, like it's inconvenient, it's, oh my God, she's already, already here. here. <laughs> um, uh, the anesthesiologist is mad because she wasted a day. The surgeon is pissed because he, he needs to make his car, his boat payment. The answer is the difficult airway will give it a shot. If we can do it safely, we'll do half of it because we are afraid that you would not, if it pops out, would be in trouble. And if we can't, we call it a day. Right. So we use, and this is a, the second oh, thing. Like, actually, we actually we did not have the, we the glidescope was coming like the next day. Remember, right? So, but having yeah. the glidescope is one of the things that are important. Is having the right equipment available right. in the event. So that's why you don't want to go to a chin C, yeah, surgery center. So people are like, oh, I don't understand what's the difference. They're all surgery centers. No, the more advanced the surgery center is, the better the equipment. Better equipment is used when you have issues. Mm -hmm. On a garden routine variety case, you don't need it, but there's an entity called a glidoscope, not very expensive, but it's basically a camera based scope. At any rate, long story short, bottom lines, we intubated her, we did her case and everything went, went, went well. Yes. So point there, your doctor and your anesthesiologist have to be prepared. And when they're prepared, they need to make tough decisions, which is cancel cases if necessary. So mm -hmm. that, that's case one. Or we, cancel or modify. Uh, modify. Exactly. We had another lady, which, um, Let's talk about the lady who um, had the heart thing. Yeah. Um, had a really lovely patient, um, otherwise pretty healthy, uh, maybe early 40s, late 30s. And uh, we were doing a, a case at the surgery center. And approximately halfway through the case, I uh, look up and her heart rate's uh, kind of going up. And then I said, well, is this just pain or is, is she just getting like a little bit like a little bit light, maybe needs a little bit more anesthesia to be all the way asleep, you know, on an accident or something. I said, no, it's not either one of those things. So her heart rate was really, really high and it was um, an abnormal heart rhythm that she was having. Um, so I immediately... So freak out, call the police. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> call 911. No, um, so notify the, the surgeon. surgeon. And I said, I don't care. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, surgery. I don't know exactly what you're doing, but it's really causing it. No, I'm just kidding. So notify the surgeon that, uh, hey, this is going on. I think this is a real abnormal heart rhythm and I'm going to treat it and I'm going to let you know if that works. If it doesn't work, we may have to modify the surgery or change the plan for the right. surgery today. So this is yet another example. Bottom line, you're going to hear over and over again. Medicine is often smooth but it can on occasion be unpredictable having great doctors is not about the times where things go well having great doctors is about the rare times where things don't go well and how they handle those situations and so i i stress over and over again anesthesia is incredibly safe when in the hands of a great anesthesia provider the last part of our segment is going to be the pe the place where most people are going to be most excited not because of the bad outcomes but because it involves celebrities <laughs> and so we're going to talk about where people have gotten, uh, where anesthesia has gotten a bad rap. And often with most things, it's through celebrities and bad outcomes and deaths associated with celebrities because then people say to themselves, oh my God, Joan Rivers or Michael Jackson or Kanye West's mom. So let's just briefly, without mm -hmm. getting too political or whatever, let's dive into, because the way I like to say it is almost seldom does something go wrong without a good reason, right? Like it's not... Well, there was a lightning and it just happened. No, <laughs> some, someone decided to make a bad decision somewhere along the way. And that bad decision led to the bad outcome, not anesthesia. So let's just kind of briefly go through these people. Joan Rivers, she went in for, I think it was an endoscopy or what was it? An upper bronchus? I, I believe it was some sort of upper endoscopy or some upper Some ENT or upper right. airway related thing. It was thing. definitely ENT. Right. And she was done in a... It, not in a hospital. Correct. It wasn't a surgery center, if I understand. It was, and it was in a, like a procedure room, right? And she was, what, what happened? She was under conscious sedation and she aspirated? What was it? Um, I, the only thing that I'm pretty certain of is that she was under conscious sedation. And I, my understanding was that she lost the airway. That, that, so, so does this mean that you should never do conscious sedation? No, we shouldn't make it. But my point being is that it wasn't that Kanye, uh, uh, Joan Rivers died because she had a bronchoscope. It wasn't because it was in a clinic. It wasn't because it was conscious sedation. It was that there wasn't, they weren't prepared. And my understanding is that, uh, and we can just use it in as, a, as, a, as an ex extrapolation. When you're doing conscious sedation, you have to hang the patient in a very small segment of anesthesia. 
If they're too awake, they won't tolerate the procedure. And if they're too deep asleep, they're going to not breathe on their own. Mm -hmm. If they stop breathing on their own, well, you better be ready to breathe for them. And that requires for you to take over their breathing and put a tube in, which is called general anesthesia. So in some ways, it's a little more challenging. And so I believe that in her instance, they lost her ability to breathe and they couldn't get an airway in fast enough and she stopped breathing for enough of a period of time and she expired. So then we'll shift over to Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson didn't die from having surgery, but he did die from propofol. What happened after he died in terms of the hospital and propofol? Well, one one thing that I can say with pretty good certainty is it was not only just propofol, but it was a combination of propofol mixed with other medications. Uh, so propofol an, is bad, right? Propofol is terrible. Propofol is, in in most circumstances, is a great medication. Propofol is a great medication in normal circumstances where all of the criteria are met, all of the monitoring criteria and the personnel so what happened, criteria are met, are met. So they were in a house mm-hmm. um, with which it shouldn't have, been done in a house without like a separate physician's orders for like maybe some sort of I don't think it's approved for use in anyone's house at all period propofol but at any rate no one was watching and you know that was a situation that just shouldn't have happened at all propofol is an amazing drug it's an anesthetic it does wonders in certain circumstances and the problem is that you use propofol in a home to help a patient fall asleep with no monitoring and no supervision and that person didn't stop breathing. And and what I can say is, now I can speak, this is my own experience. So for three years after that, three years after that, people were like, I'm not going to get propofol, am I? Right. And I'm like, I, you know, I have to explain propofol is a wonderful drug. It's you, it's a, you won't get a lot of nausea with it. Um, it, we, it can wear off quickly. It's a really wonderful drug. We're going to be in a controlled circumstance i'll be there with you the entire time right, right at your you'll side be right yeah you'll be monitored you'll like, have oxygen that's like having pasta and having some chef put in cinnamon and then you're like oh my god cinnamon is terrible cinnamon is fine the problem is the chef the chef is the one who you should be angry at he, who puts cinnamon in a pasta why would you use profile in the house so that takes care of that and the last one of <laughs> course is is kanye west mom and while nobody knows the exact circumstances of it what we use the celebrity this misfortunes for is to educate people. And so Kanye's West mom, from what we understand today, she she died and she Mm -hmm. died prematurely. And she died not because, you know, there was a lot of, I was getting back backslash. It was a lot of people saying, Oh my God, she did tummy tuck and a breast reduction. That's why she died. She did too much surgery. She was too old. She bled to death. Mm -hmm. No, no. And no, Kanye West mom was seen and pre-opt. She was an older woman with medical conditions, heart conditions, okay? And she didn't get the adequate clearance for her to undergo that kind of surgery. And due to pressures, she went and had the surgery anyways, whether that was the anesthesiologist's fault or whoever's fault. So again, the problem isn't that Kanye West's mom had these procedures. It's not that Kanye West's mom had a heart condition. It was that the recipe was not done correctly. And as a result, instead of getting a better workup, optimizing her heart condition so that she could have a successful outcome, they ignored it and went around it. And as a result, she, she, she died way too young. So if the, mess, the one message I wanted to make sure gets across during our entire two episodes is that anesthesia is amazing. And without it, we couldn't do not only cosmetic surgery, but we couldn't do my wife's spine surgery. We mm-hmm. couldn't we couldn't do so many amazing things that we do today. And that because of a few bad apples, I don't want patients to be fearful of anesthesia because it really is an amazing uh, modern day advancement. The key is like everything we say every time is you got to be self-educated, knowledgeable, don't cut corners and make sure you end up with the right set of professionals. Mm-hmm. And, um, I know uh, you and a few other people have said, hey, you know, if you get a chance, you can ask, do you happen to know who might be doing my anesthesia, my anesthesia for my surgery? Yeah. You know, who, who's my anesthesiologist going to be, you know, or, or at least out of a few people who might it be, right. something like that. Well, anyways, it was a true pleasure to have you. We've talked about this now for umpteen years. <laughs> And we finally got you here, and I really appreciate it. It's, I know it's your time off. I know you got time with your family. Your family's always been 
supportive of you in doing these things. And I think it's really important to get this message out because it's, it's a great topic. And uh, I hope to have you back <laughs> if, you, uh, if you would be so kind. And uh, that's it. So I really uh, uh, encourage you all to continue listening. Make sure to share our podcast. Uh, uh, subscribe to it. And most importantly, download. Here's to another episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. We would love to get your feedback. If you enjoyed and found our podcast helpful, tell us why. Give us the review and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or you can go directly to revolverpodcast.com. If you have a topic you would like us to talk about, then please reach out to us on Facebook, Roddy Rabon, Instagram, at Dr. Roddy Rabon, or RoddyRabon.com. You are listening to Plastic Surgery Uncensored with Dr. Roddy Rabon on Revolver Podcast.